Hello, family and friends, day 246 of reading and studying through the Bible in 365. My name is Kanoi. Welcome to Bible study. And if you are new here, please, as always, let us know where you are in the world. We love to hear about different cultures, different countries joining in with us. We are all one big family here, and we are excited that you're here. Everything you need for this Bible study, all the tools, all the things I use can all be found in the description box below, as well as uh, the information for our Facebook group, how you can get in touch with me if you need to, and lots of other good stuff, lots of resources down there. If everybody else could help us out by giving this video a thumbs up and making sure you're subscribed to the channel and also hitting the notification bell. All right, before we get started, let's pray. It is officially the Sabbath day coming to an end. The sun has set, so I'm able to go back to work. <laughs> but I figured I would go ahead and film this video and get ahead as I am catching a plane here in a couple of hours again. So thank you so much, Lord, for giving me this time, carving it out, helping me to be disciplined to come here. And thank you for every person who has disciplined themselves to come before you, to be in your presence and to read your word. We are so grateful that we have this ability to do so. May we never take it for granted, God, because we know there are people in the world who don't have this ability, who don't have the resources, who don't have the time, who don't even have the freedom to be able to freely worship you. And so I just thank you for that extra today. And so I just pray that when we read things, Lord, that might seem a little bit dreary, dry, that we'll remember that, that we have this privilege to be able to read this word, to know you more, to get a better understanding of why you did things. And God, I was always out of love and compassion. And may we always have that heart and those eyes open to see that because we don't ever want our hearts to harden toward you. May they always remain soft and fertile as you plant seeds, God. May they flourish. So thank you so much for this time together. I pray that you bless every single person. Lord, you know exactly what it is that they need today. So I pray that you minister to their hearts. Let them know that you love them. Let them know, God, that you are there for them, that you'll never leave them, and that you are meeting their needs even if they can't feel it, God. I pray that you will give them some sort of revelation today to walk away from this Bible study changed. We love you so much. Please forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. So today's reading is chapters 23 and 24. So we start off here with sort of like a metaphor. We're talking about two daughters of the mother, which will be considered Israel. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man. There were two women, the daughters of one mother. So again, she's Israel. And the two daughters, we will see, they played the whore in Egypt, and then they played the whore in their youth. There their breasts were pressed and their virgin bosoms handled. Ohola, which means tabernacle, represents the 10 northern tribes, so represents the northern part of Israel, was the name of the elder, and Oholaba, which means my tent is in her, represents the southern kingdom, because God's tent, or the temple, was in Jerusalem, which is in Judah, in the southern portion, was the name of her sister. They became mine. Remember, they were the chosen ones. And they bore sons and daughters. As for their names, Ohola is Samaria and Oholaba is Jerusalem. Ohola played the whore while she was mine and she lusted after her lovers. So her lovers being those that she politically made alliances with. Also, all of the people that she followed after with her idolatry. The Assyrians, warriors clothed in purple, governors and commanders, all of them desirable young men, horsemen riding on horses, and she bestowed her whoring upon them, the choicest men of Assyria, all of them, and she defiled herself with all the idols of everyone after whom she lusted. She did not give up her whoring that she had begun in Egypt, for in her youth men had lain with her and handled her virgin bosom and poured out their whoring lust upon her. Therefore I delivered her into the hands of her lover into the hands of the Assyrians after whom she lusted. So basically, he gave them over to the very people that they were uh, admiring, that they wanted to be like. They ended up being the ones destroying them. So this is sort of a reminder how God has already judged Samaria through Assyria. Therefore, I delivered her into the hands of her lovers, into the hands of the Assyrians after whom she lusted, and these uncovered her nakedness 
They seized her sons and her daughters, and as for her, they killed her with the sword, and she became a byword among women when judgment had been executed on her. So this meaning, a byword meaning, a synonym for immoral nation. Uh, basically, people were talking about her. Uh, they saw Israel as no longer a nation that was beautiful, no longer a godly nation, but an immoral one. Her sister Oholaba saw this. So this is now talking about the southern tribes. They saw exactly what happened to Israel. You would have thought they would have learned a lesson, but did they? No. And she became more corrupt. So they did even more so because of the fact uh, is it, it's considered more corrupt, one, because they really should have known better having the tabernacle in their midst and you know the priests and everybody around them but also because they already saw what happened with her and they are more corrupt than her sister in her lust and in her whoring which was worse than that of her sister she lusted after the assyrians governors commanders warriors clothed in full armor horsemen riding on horses all of them desirable young men and i saw that she was defiled they both took the same way, but she carried her whorings further. She saw men portrayed on the wall, the images of the Chaldeans portrayed in vermilion. Vermilion were kind of like a red color, and this was their sort of social media of the day. They were looking at what was going on with these other nations and were like, we want to be like them. And it was funny because right before I read this, I was flipping through social media and I came across an ad for, I think it was some sort of skincare or something. And I just thought to myself, why do all of these social media influencers all sound alike? They all say the same things. They all talk the same way. And I can't help but think like, oh, well, I think it stemmed from sort of the Kardashian era and then, you know, broke into these social media influencers, you know, with their, I'm literally obsessed. I mean, that's one of the things that it seems like they all say. I'm not trying to make fun of them. Please hear my heart on this. I'm just saying that they have all kind of looked at one another, admired one another, which is not a bad thing, and then kind of copied one another. And so that was what was kind of going on here. So uh, they portrayed in vermilion, wearing belts on their waist with flowing turbans on their heads, all of them having the appearance of officers, a likeness of Babylonians whose native land was Chaldea. And when she saw them, she lusted after them and sent messengers to them in Chaldea. So Chaldea, again, being the word for Babylon as a whole. And the Babylonians came to her into the bed of love, and they defiled her with their whoring lust. And after she was defiled by them, she turned from them in disgust. Now, when she carried on her whoring so openly and flaunted her nakedness, I turned in disgust from her, as I had turned in disgust from her sister. So... This is speaking of the coming defeat by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC that God is going to allow. Yet she increased her whoring, remembering the days of her youth when she played the whore in the land of Egypt and lusted after her lovers there, whose members were like those of donkeys and whose issue was like that of horses. Thus you longed for the lewdness of your youth when the Egyptians handled your bosom and pressed your young breasts. So remember, they renewed their alliance with Egypt. And the moral of all of this is that the things that they lusted after would basically end up destroying them. So God would not make these things destroy them, but God would allow them to take over because they refused to have a change of heart. Therefore, O Oholaba, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will stir up against you your lovers from whom you turned in disgust, and I will bring them against you from every side, the Babylonians and all the Chaldeans, Pekud and Shoah and Koah, and these were the tribal vassals of Babylon that would actually join in the assault, and all the Assyrians with them, desirable young men, governors and commanders, all of them, officers and men of renown, all of them riding on horses, and they shall become... Or they shall come against you from the north with chariots and wagons and a host of peoples. They shall set themselves against you on every side with buckler, which is a large rectangular shield, shield and helmet. And I will commit the judgment to them and they shall judge you according to their judgments. And I will direct my jealousy against you that they may deal with you in fury. They shall cut off your nose and your ears, which sounds terrible, maybe 
almost a little bit unreal, but this was a very real thing because in ancient slavery, this was what they did to punish their people. And your survivors shall fall by the sword. They shall seize your sons and your daughters and your survivors shall all be devoured by fire. They shall also strip you of your clothes and take away your beautiful jewels. Thus I will put an end to your lewdness and your whoring begun in the land of Egypt, so that you shall not lift up your eyes to them or remember Egypt any more. So this disfigurement, I asked, is this a literal disfigurement or will it be a figurative one? Probably both, I'm thinking, because if they did indeed do this back in this day, um, obviously figuratively they will be defiled and disfigured. For thus says the Lord God, behold, I will deliver you into the hand of those whom you hate, which is Babylon, into the hands of those from whom you turned in disgust, and they shall deal with you in hatred and take away all the fruit of your labor and leave you naked and bare, and the nakedness of your whoring shall be uncovered. So they will basically be laid out in shame. Your lewdness and your whoring have brought this upon you because you played the whore with the nations and defiled yourself with their idols. You have gone the way of your sister, therefore I will give her cup into your hand. So this cup is speaking of the cup of wrath or the cup of God's judgment that Israel has already faced. Now Judah or uh, the southern portion is also going to have to take of that cup. The same cup that Jesus drank from. The same cup he was asking the Father to take away if it was his will. Well, of course it wasn't and therefore Jesus took the wrath upon himself. Thus says the Lord God, you shall drink your sister's cup. Now, 100 years earlier, Israel and Samaria both fell. Jerusalem, sadly, is going to suffer the same fate. That is deep and large, and you shall be laughed at and held in derision, for it contains much. You will be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, a cup of hor horror and desolation, the cup of your sister Samaria. You shall drink it and drain it out and gnaw its shards. So basically, you are going to break even more what has already been broken. And tear your breasts, and this is a symbol of agony and anguish. So why is all of this going to happen? Well, one, it is to expose Judah's extreme unfaithfulness, but two, it is obviously to punish Judah for her idolatry and unwillingness to repent. For I have spoken, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have forgotten me and cast me behind your back, you yourself must bear the consequences of your lewdness and your whoring. So basically, idolatry and immorality was rampant at this time, but they were still going to the temple. So they were living kind of this double life, still trying to kind of front. Um, but God knows, you know, he always knows what's going on behind closed doors. And when he says that you have forgotten me, it's not that they technically forgot him, but they probably turned their eyes because they didn't want to be seen by God. They probably had their own guilt. You know, when we are walking in sin, that is one of the very reasons why we get further from the Lord because it's like we feel sh ashamed, right? Kind of like how Adam and Eve were. Whenever they realized they were in sin, they covered up their nakedness because they were afraid of what God was going to do. They were ashamed to be in front of him. And that's the same thing we do. And the Lord said to me, son of man, you will judge Ohola and Oholaba. Declare to them their abominations, for they have committed adultery. So now we have gone from the figurative speaking to now the literal things that they have done wrong. They've committed adultery and blood is on their hands. With their idols, they've committed adultery and they have even offered up to them for food the children whom they have borne to me. Moreover, this they have done to me. They have defiled my sanctuary on the same day and profaned my Sabbaths. For when they had slaughtered their children in sacrifice to their idols on the same day, they came into my sanctuary to profane it. And behold, this is what they did in my house. They even sent for men to come from afar, to whom a messenger was sent, and behold, they came. For them you bathed yourself, painted your eyes, and adorned yourself with ornaments, so you were trying to look good for them. You sat on a stately couch with a table spread before it, on which you had placed my incense and oil. The sound of a carefree multitude was with her, and with men of the common sort, drunkards were brought from the wilderness. So drunkards being the uncivilized nomads that were to the east and the south of of Israel, 
from the wilderness and they put out bracelets on the hands of the women and beautiful crowns on their heads. So basically he is saying you all have been using the holy items like the oil in your own idolatrous practices. Like that is how profane these people have become. Then I said of her who was worn out by adultery. So there are some translations that actually say that she has aged or she looks older. And adultery, sin will do that to you. It will physically age you. Now, they will continue to use her for a whore, even her, for they have gone into her as men go into a prostitute. Thus, they went into Ohola and to Oholaba, lewd women. But the righteous men shall pass judgment on them. And I put a big question mark because I don't know that I was really quite sure about these righteous men, but righteous men shall pass judgment on them with the sentence of adulteresses and with the sentence of women who shed blood because they are adulteresses and blood is on their hands. So they were not righteous, these men, by way of action, but only as instruments used by God. That is what I ended up reading. So I guess that was after my question mark. This is the note that I took is that these men aren't technically righteous by action, but righteous in the sense that they are righteously being used by God. For thus says the Lord God, bring up a vast host against them and make them an object of terror and plunder. And the host shall stone them and cut them down with their swords. Because remember, stoning and execution was the punishment for adultery in this day. They shall kill their sons and their daughters and burn up their houses. Thus I will put an end to lewdness in the land that all women may take warning and not commit lewdness as you have done. And they shall return your lewdness upon you and you shall bear the penalty for your sinful idolatry and you shall know that I am the Lord God. So once again, it all comes back to this, his holy judgment and the glorious restoration of the people was his ultimate purpose. And now finally, after 23 chapters has gone by, and I don't say finally as in, thank God it's here, but finally everything that has been talked about comes to a head where we see the invasion actually begin here and taking place. So this is uh, specifically on, or in, I should say, January of 588 BC, which is when Nebuchadnezzar began his attack. And this date actually became so well known. It was almost like 9-11. Like you could say that date back in this day and everyone would know what you're talking about. So in the ninth year, in the 10th month, on the 10th day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, write down the name of this day. So there it is. Like this has become a day that no one's going to forget. This very day, the king of Babylon has laid siege to Jerusalem this very day and utter a parable to the rebellious house and say to them, thus says the Lord God. So now we're going back to figurative speech, going back to a parable. Set on the pot, set it on, pour in water also. Well, this would be hot water if you're putting it in a pot, right? So basically, you guys are in hot water at this point. God's anger was beyond the boiling point. Put it in, put in it the pieces of meat, all the good pieces, the thigh, the shoulder, fill it with choice bones. Take the choicest one of the flock, which is God's chosen people, pile the logs under it, boil it well, seethe also its bones in it, bones being used for fuel. So Jerusalem is basically being cooked here and they are going to be a feast for Babylon. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, woe to the bloody city, to the pot whose corrosion is in it. And this being a filth or scum and whose corrosion has not gone out of it. Take out of it piece after piece without making any choice. So basically, God is not going to play favorites here. Every single person is going to be affected. For the blood she has shed is in her midst. She put it on the bare rock. She did not pour it out on the ground to cover it with dust. So there were no proper burials at this point for the people. They are going to be exposed um, and she will remain exposed to the judgment of God. To rouse my wrath, to take vengeance, I have set on the bare rock the blood she has shed, that it may not be covered. Therefore thus says the Lord God, Woe to the bloody city, I also will make the pile great. Heap on the logs, kindle the fire, boil the meat well, mix in the spices and let the bones be burned up. 
Then set it empty upon the coals, that it may become hot, and its copper may burn, that its uncleanness may be melted in it, corrosion consumed. She was we er, has wearied herself with toil. Its abundant corrosion does not go out of it. Into the fire with its corrosion. So basically, all of this filth, this scum that God had been calling upon them to get rid of, they didn't. And so he's like, into the pot, all of you, all of your sin, it all goes in there. She has wearied herself with toil. It's abundant corrosion. Oh, we already said that. Into the fire with its corrosion. On account of your unclean lewdness, because I would have cleansed you and you were not cleansed from your uncleanness. You shall not be cleansed anymore till I have satisfied my fury upon you. I am the Lord. I have spoken. It shall come to pass. I will do it. I will not go back. I will not spare. I will not relent. According to your ways and your deeds, you will be judged, declares the Lord God. So in all of the past times that he ever relented, it usually was because there was some repentance. That wasn't happening in this case here. And now when it's too late is usually the point when people say, wait, I repent. But he is saying, listen, I have given you so many chances. It's not going to happen. This is being done. My will be done. It's starting to happen. All right. What did I write here? Connected to their mission. Okay. So now we turn to the point. This is where we actually technically figure out that Ezekiel was actually married because God is calling for his wife's death, which is really kind of sad. Um, but it is for him to be able to be shown as an example to the people. So let's read and hopefully we can, we can make the connection. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, behold, I'm about to take the delight of your eyes or the like the love of your life is kind of what that means away from you at a stroke. So by his grace and mercy, her death is going to be swift and sudden. Thank God, right? Like you never want to watch somebody have to suffer and live through a drug out death. Yet you shall not mourn or weep. And this took me aback. I said, what? He's not going to allow Ezekiel to mourn or weep for his wife, the love of his life. And I mean, I can't imagine, you know, I watched my stepmom just and still to this day, you know, she's texting and calling and, and it is so sad to watch a widow or a widower ever mourn the loss of their loved one. You know, especially when they loved someone for so long. I can't imagine Ezekiel being told by God, nope, sorry, you're not gonna be able to do it. And I didn't get it at first, but I get it in the end. Nor shall your tears run down, sigh, but not aloud. Make no mourning for the dead. Bind on your turban and put your shoes on your feet. Do not cover your lips, nor eat the bread of men. So I spoke to the people in the morning and at evening my wife died. And on the next morning I did as I was commanded. So he went ahead and followed the Lord's words and did not mourn for his wife. What is going on here? I mean, he's already, you know, um, eaten a scroll of a woe. That was in the beginning. That's the first thing he did. He had to lay on his side for over a year. He had to cut his hair. He used poo as cooking fuel at one point. And he basically moved out of his house. And now this, now God taking away his wife, what is happening? Well, why is he not allowed to mourn? Because much like Aaron, remember when Aaron's sons offered up the strange fire, Nadab and Abihu, and God told Aaron, you are not to mourn their death because God was basically saying, you got work to do. We cannot stop. You cannot, you know, let this go astray and let this fall to the sidelines because if you do, God knew, God knew that if, he did stop and mourn that it was very likely that he would never get back on track to where he was supposed to be. And this really comforted my heart because I'm not going to lie, there's a little bit of guilt in me for just bullying through this, this Bible study uh, in the midst of mourning my father's death. And yet at the same time, it is by the grace of God that I've been able to do this. It has been his strength within me because otherwise I don't know how I would have done it. 
you know, I told my sisters and I kind of joke about it. I'm like, my face wants to sit down every day. <laughs> I'm just, I still am in a brain fog. And I appreciate those of you who have reached out and, you know, kind of expressed that you see it in me. I, I'm trying to rise up above, you know, the grief and the mourning and the sadness, but you can't hide grief. If, if grief is there, it's there. And so I get that. I'm not going to try to be fake or anything like that, but I also am going to hold fast to the joy of the Lord and know and trust that all things are working out for good, for the glory of God and for his purposes. And so that's what keeps me going. But this is what was happening here. God was like, listen, Ezekiel, you can't stop and mourn because I'm afraid that you won't be able to get back on. You know, you're going to be permanently sidelined if you stop now. And I just thought, man, would I, would I be willing to forego my own healing process? Would I be willing to forego the rescuing of God? Would I be willing to forego God's protection if he called me to be an example to others? And there have been times in my life where he has. I feel like this very situation, you know, with all of the things that have happened to me this year, and yet God still somehow gave me strength to pull through each and every day. And and I guess I could answer that, yeah, I would be willing to, but I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I were doing something else and something else happened, would I be sidelined, you know? I, I'm never going to be so self-righteous to say, oh yeah, I would, I would never deny Christ. I mean, I have denied him in my own way, you know? We all have, I'm sure, at one point or another. So that is an interesting heart check right there. Are you willing to forego the comforts, the healing, the protection of God if he calls you to be the example? So like, you know, if God said you can't mourn your, the death of your loved one, move on. Let's keep going. <laughs> it's rough. And the people said to me, will you not tell us what these things mean for us? Okay, so usually if there was unusual activity now it is piquing their interest. You know, as the days went on, it was like status quo, you know, things are normal. They weren't interested. But now that something's a little bit off, they're like, wait a minute, what's going on here? You know, something's awry. And they want to know now, what does this mean for us that you're acting like this? Then I said to them, the word of the Lord came to me, say to the house of Israel. So now we're seeing his situation being turned over to be that example. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will profane my sanctuary, the pride of your power. So basically kind of the love of your life, right? So this is um, his wife being depicted in this sense. So that being the temple that kind of had this false sense of security because the temple was in their midst and they thought they'd never be destroyed. The delight of your eyes, the yearning of your soul and your sons and your daughters whom you left behind shall fall by the sword and you shall do as I have done. You shall not cover your lips nor eat the bread of men. Your turbans shall be on your heads and your shoes on your feet. You shall not mourn or weep, but you shall rot away in your iniquities and groan to one another. Thus shall Ezekiel be assigned to you. According to all that he has done, you shall do. When this comes, then you will know that I am the Lord God. So this basically also displayed God's inability to mourn what they're about to go through because he had to carry out their judgment. Same thing. If he stopped in his feelings to mourn what was about to happen or mourn what was happening, there was probably a very good chance because he's so gracious and kind and compassionate that he would sideline his own, you know, his own self, his own purpose. But he's like, I can't. We got we have to take care of this because otherwise it's only going to get worse. As for you, son of man, surely on the day when I take from them their stronghold, their joy and glory, the delight of their eyes and their soul's desire and also their sons and daughters, on that day a fugitive will come to you to report to you the news. On that day your mouth will be open to the fugitive and you shall speak and be no longer mute. Oh, okay. So God is going to close the mouth of Ezekiel. Interesting. Take note of this because this is going to be mentioned down the road. So you will be assigned to them and they will know that I am the Lord. Now, thankfully, when Ezekiel speaks once again, it's actually going to be a little more 
bright, <laughs> a little less doom and gloom, a little more hopeful. He will actually be seen as more of an encourager instead of being the person who is bringing this grim warning. Heaven is a divine gift to us that is given by grace. We're not going to get it because we are indeed righteous. We are getting it because God loves us. But again, we will not receive that promised land. We will not receive that gift of eternal life if we don't receive Jesus. So I wanna give someone that opportunity today who is saying, I've never done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm gonna go after I die, but I see now that that is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're gonna say a prayer I'm going to put the words on the screen so you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he died and he rose again, then you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I thank you that all of my sins are forgiven. I confess of my sin, I turn from them, and I live my life for you. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.